Everybody sing A B C D E F G H I J K L M F G M M N A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G The Western musical alphabet uses the first seven letters of the Latin alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. This pattern repeats itself infinitely, both forwards and backwards. After G comes another A, and before A comes G. Each of these letters can be modified, but since we're working with the neutral versions first, we're going to call them natural. Sometimes you will see the natural symbol after the letter, but we'll talk about those situations in a second. For now, remember that a letter by itself and the letter with the natural symbol are synonymous, and they mean the same thing. The distance from A to the A before or after it is called an octave. In Western music, the octave is broken up into 12 equal parts, called semitones or half steps. Two semitones equal a whole tone which is also known as a whole step. There are two pairs of notes that are a semitone apart, B and C, and E and F. All of the other letters are a whole tone apart from each other. The letters of the musical alphabet- Wait, hold on. Why are there 12 half steps in an octave? Why not 10 or 20? Why 12? And if there are 12 half steps in an octave, why don't we just use the first 12 letters of the alphabet instead of the first seven? And why are there half steps between some letters and whole steps between other letters? This is not making sense. Why, why have all these- Patience. Patience. Those are some great questions, and I've asked myself the same things. There are definitely answers to those questions, but they require a lot more knowledge first. Acoustical physics and math play a huge role in all of this, but if I introduce that right now, we would just create more questions without answering any. It would be like me trying to explain trigonometry to someone that doesn't understand the order of operations yet. I can give you an explanation, but I think it would just confuse you further. Instead, my goal is to try and provide you with enough knowledge so that you can answer these questions on your own. For now, just hold on tight, and I promise that things will start making sense soon. Everything is a process. To help wrap your head around the musical alphabet, try this instead. Draw a horizontal line on a piece of paper with 12 tick marks just like a number line in math class. The tick marks represent the 12 semitones. Underneath the first tick mark, put an A. Skip the next tick mark because all of the letters are a whole tone apart from each other, except for the pairs that I mentioned earlier, B and C and E and F. When you're finished, it should look like this. You can double check by counting the tick marks making sure that B and C and E and F are next to each other, and that there is nothing written underneath the last tick mark because the next tick mark after that is an A, an octave above our first A. As you travel to the right, the pitches of these letters go higher and higher. If you go to the left, the pitches go lower. Each of these pitches can be modified by raising them or lowering them by a semitone. The flat, which looks like a lowercase b, but, well, flattened, is used to lower a pitch by a semitone. All of the letters of the musical alphabet can be lowered by a semitone. All you need to do is add a flat symbol after the letter. Since we say letters first, these notes would be called A flat, B flat, C flat, D flat, E flat, F flat, and G flat. To find where these notes go on our musical number line, just locate the natural letter and go back one tick mark. If this is B, B flat would be placed right before it, right underneath this tick mark. If you put it here, you'd be correct. C flat is a tricky one, but if you follow my directions from a second ago, all you have to do is locate the natural letter and go back one tick mark. If C is here, that means this tick mark is C flat and B. When you have two names for the same pitch, they are enharmonic. Think of the words there, there, and there. 
They all sound exactly the same when they're spoken, but when you write them down, they have different spellings. Based on the context of the situation, the spelling matters. This is just like B and C flat. They sound the same when you hear them, but based on the context of the musical situation, the spelling will matter. Keep that in mind as we move forward. If D is here, D flat is right here. Same with E and E flat. Where is F flat located? This is just like the situation we had a second ago. E and F flat are enharmonically equivalent, one pitch with two names. If G is here, where is G flat? And lastly, what would this tick mark be called? If you're confused, think about what letter comes after G in the musical alphabet. Since the musical alphabet repeats infinitely, the next letter is A. This means that the tick mark right before A is called A flat. Instead of lowering natural pitches, we can also raise them. The sharp, not to be confused with a number symbol or a hashtag, is used to raise a pitch by a semitone in the same way that a flat is used to lower pitch by a semitone. All of the letters of the musical alphabet can be raised by a semitone as well. All you need to do is add a sharp symbol after the letter. Again, the way to correctly say these is by saying the letter followed by a sharp. A sharp, B sharp, C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F sharp, and G sharp. Let's go back to our ever-expanding musical number line. To find where an A sharp is, we need to go in the opposite direction than when we went when we were trying to find an A flat. A sharp is one tick mark after A. What does that make A sharp and B flat? Exactly, they're enharmonic. The same thing is true with all other sharps. B sharp is enharmonic to C. C sharp is enharmonic to D flat. D sharp is enharmonic to E flat. E sharp is enharmonic to F. F sharp is enharmonic to G flat. And G sharp is enharmonic to A flat. We have completed our musical number line. The best way to remember all of this is to condense it down so that all you have to think about is which direction you have to move. In my classrooms, I only keep the basic version of the musical number line visible. This way, my students can find the pitch that they're looking for without being too visually overwhelmed. Now, before we move on to all the keys of the piano and their correlating frequencies, let's do a quick quiz to see if you understand the pitches. Now, if you get more than a few wrong, I'd suggest following the time codes provided and re-watching those parts of the video. Let's make it a little bit more interactive this time. Try and physically point to the pitch when I name it. This will help your brain connect the information visually and tactilely. I will also play the note so that you can hear it orally. Ready? Here we go. First, let's try and recreate the musical number line. A. B. C. D. E. F. G. I'm going to take away the letters from the musical number line. Let's see if you can do the same thing without seeing the letters. B. C. E. G. A. F. D. C. E. G. B. D. This time, I'm going to keep the natural letters on the screen. I want to see if you can find the sharps. D sharp. F sharp. C sharp. G sharp. E sharp. B sharp. A sharp. 
do the same thing with flats this time. E flat. D flat. G flat. C flat. A flat. F flat. Let's see if you can remember the sharps and the flats from memory. F sharp. B flat. C flat. A sharp. G flat. E sharp. D flat. D sharp. F flat. B sharp. C sharp. Now be honest, how did you do? If you started to get some answers wrong and you don't know why, go back and follow the time codes that correspond with that level. If you answered most or all of them correctly, the next step would be to apply them to your instrument. All of this music theory is great to know, but it serves little to no function if you don't actually utilize it. So challenge yourself. See if you can apply your knowledge of the musical alphabet to a new instrument that you haven't learned yet. Remember, the best way to learn something is by teaching it. Ja, matane. Ja.